where we did get consensus from the union movement on taking action on climate change. It may not be fabulous, but I'm proud of that. And that was true, first of all. And I agree, you know, we need to talk about the realities. We do need to talk about the realities of global warming. It's so hard. It's so hard to get over that that enormous barrier that's been put up about the carbon price and all the rubbish about energy prices going through the roof, etc. But we need to do it because right now for people, the reality, the reality out there, I can tell you because I'm still out there campaigning on this, is that a carbon price is going to put all my energy costs up and I'm going to lose my job. That is what people still think is often the reality of this and it is just not true. You and I know that's not true. So we have to get out there, we have to keep talking, we have to be patient, and we have to shift that whole sense. I'm not sure exactly how we're going to do it, but I can guarantee you here and now that the union movement, including myself, are out there every single day talking to our members about this. And so I hope that you are too. It's very easy, it's very lovely to be in an environment like this where everyone's on the same page, but that is not the reality for a lot of us people out there campaigning around this. So thank you very, very much. Um, look, I also really enjoyed all of the contributions from the panellists and there are not many points of difference, but I picked out four areas that I think I ought to address, partly because they're questions raised about Labor's response and the Labor Party's response, and partly just things that I think are important. The first one I think goes to coal and gas, and it was raised by a number of people. Um, I want to say a few things about coal and gas because I think it's a very, very important part of the debate and it's a very important threshold question for how we work together as a movement. The decisions to invest in coal and gas are being made by industry, not by government. And I think that the assertion that it is being made by government is for the most part wrong. And you may not agree with me, but I'm going to put my view and we can have a debate about it. Um, but I want to say this about it. There are many impacts. There are many local impacts which governments need to deal with in a serious way and they go to the biodiversity impacts of having a whole series of roads and wells through native vegetation, they go to the impacts on water systems and water sources, they go through the impacts on cultural heritage and they go to the impacts on landscape which I think are being increasingly recognised as a something that has innate and important value for communities and, and Australian people. Those things are relevant to the permitting system and I think that there is going to be, over time, an inevitable tightening of the arrangements around that because I think that the community is fearful about the level of change and the pace of change in the expansion of these industries across the landscape. I think that is simply a practical reality um, of Australian politics and you see all sorts of governments of all sorts of flavours dealing with that. But I want to put this position to you. I know you won't agree with it, but I, I'm going to tell you something that I believe tactically about the climate change impacts of this. Our basic position is that other countries will make their own decisions about their pathways towards uh, climate change mitigation. There is very little that we can do in terms of cutting our own exports to influence whether or not other countries utilise coal as an energy source and what role coal plays in their mix. Okay, I'm going to put the view, you can shout at me if you like, but I'm here to debate and very few people I think come to debate with you and either you like it, you appreciate that or you don't, but I'm here to engage. Um, I want to say this to you that there are plenty of hard battles we've got to fight. Christine laid out some of them. We've got to fight a battle about the RET, We've got to fight a battle about the price. We probably have to fight a battle about energy efficiency. And we're going to have to have a very hard conversation about adaptation. I want to say to you that my judgment is that starting a fight with mainstream Australia about shutting down an, an industry that they believe is essential to economic prosperity is not the right fight to pick at this time. And I say that particularly because I don't believe that it will have any difference on the amount of coal that India imports. It will simply change the source of their imports. Thanks. 
All right. Well, I really look forward to your comments, and I'm just putting a position, and but. I can skip over it, I can pretend that the issue is not there, or I can try and address it for you, and I'm doing what I can and putting my view. <laughs> I don't actually think that's the position that's put in the Murdoch press, to be honest. I think it's maybe more nuanced, but that's up. you'll make your own judgement. Um, I want to say something about the assertion that the two parties are exactly the same. Um, I think that... If we are still hearing that after a decade of inaction from Howard, um, after the decisions recently to impose onerous restrictions on wind farms, uh, to abolish support for solar and the attacks that are now being made on the rent, if you really think that there is no difference between the two major parties, I think that is a misunderstanding of the current political environment in relation to climate change. There are, pe there are differences. There are differences, but you have... Look, I've had the reform or revolution debate many, many times. I've been an activist for a long time. And I think in the current environment, if you do believe the outcomes will be the same from the two major parties, then I think it's a serious misreading of the situation. I also want to talk a little bit... I've only got three minutes, I'll probably use them up. But I want to talk a bit about the idea that a price on carbon is sort of illegitimate because it's a market-based instrument. We talk a lot about the market component, but the core element of the whole enterprise is placing a regulatory cap each year on the amount of carbon that can be emitted from industry in this country. It is essentially a regulatory mechanism which says this is the cap and then participants, you go and work out which, how much of what's available to you you're going to be able to use using the market. And I think the regulatory component of it is one that's often overlooked in a conversation that emphasises the trading elements of the scheme. And I guess finally I want to say something about campaigning and reinforce the story that I told about the need to set the tone and the space for political action in this country. And I was really heartened and interested, I think, to hear that Christine and I may be on a similar page in relation to this. I have a view about how social change happens. I don't think that social change is generally led by the parliament. I think that most changes happen because the community demands them and the parliament, parliamentarians take that opportunity and act on it. I think that what happens is that the community movement opens the door and good parliamentary leaders, responsive and thoughtful parliamentary leaders, walk through the door. And I guess my challenge to you is that today and the next couple of days is an enormous opportunity for you all to think about how your work is going to open doors that parliamentarians can walk through because we are facing a very, very, essentially an existential threat to the, all of the achievements of the climate movement over the last few years. And I really think that now is the time to get organised, to think about how we act and how it uh, reinforces uh, the ability of our parliamentarians to successfully show the leadership that we want them to that we want them to show. So thank you very much, and we look forward to the questions. I'm sure there'll be a lot. Uh, we've got two more speakers um, who will have an opportunity to respond to their fellow panellists. Um, I just might encourage people to display uh, good manners. So I know it's a Friday night, but we're not at the pub. Um, and there will be a Q&A session after this, and you'll have an opportunity to ask your questions. So if you could uh, please just respect, uh, respect the speakers, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Thank you. Simon. It, it's my view that um, uh, gas and, and coal companies are uh, spreading, expanding in Australia because the government lets them. Mm -hmm. um, the government supports them. The government subsidises them to the federally to the 12, uh, tune of about $12 billion a year to support fossil fuel uh, industries. Um, and I'm reading, I'm reading a terrific book right now by Sharon Munro. It's a book called Rich Land Wasteland. And, and she's gone and, and, and interviewed people who are impacted by the fossil fuel juggernaut all across Australia, mainly Queensland and, and New South Wales, and time after again, she, come, she tells these heartbreaking stories of, of farmers, in some cases, who have, have been on the land for generations, some of the richest farmland um, in the country, and we know that climate change is a threat to our food, we know that 
agricultural security is, is, is crucial. And, and the laws on the side of the coal companies, the laws on the side of coal seam gas companies. Um, governments can just declare projects state significant, and then there you can't stop it. Um, so that is, that is the, that there's a nexus between government and um, and these businesses, which is which we have to break, I think, to get substantial change. Um, and I, mean, I think, of course, there are differences between Liberal and Labor, but diff there are not big enough differences to make a difference. Um, the, law, the laws of physics, uh, chemics, uh, laws of law, laws of physics and chemistry um, trump the laws of, of politics as usual. Um, and we cannot accept business as usual or politics as usual any longer. And perhaps you might reason that if we had 100 years to deal with a climate change threat, then we might tactically decide to put off taking on some of the biggest and most powerful industries in Australia. Um, if we had the time, we might say, let's take on other industries and we'll leave coal till later. Um, but again, the, the, the actual science is narrowing our options. And what might have been considered smart tactical moves at one time in Australian politics um, become ways of, de of, of not denying the problem, but denying some of the, the battles which we cannot put off any longer. We cannot put on And I think that our movement, it's a, we have a very difficult task, but that is something which we can't shirk from. And um, of course, the future um, is a sunny and windy future. There's not a future um, where we're choking on fossil fuels. Uh, thank you. I'd just like to make a few quick points. Uh, the first one is... Um, John, I don't think you're on the right track suggesting that the Gillard government will be changing the structure of the clean energy package in, relations to, in relation to emissions trading in the budget. Um, I can be fairly confident that won't be happening. Uh, not least of which because the Greens hold the balance of power in both houses. Um, but, uh, and that's a critical component of it. But uh, the fact of the matter is you have to go back to first principles. We heard all this with the, when Kevin Rudd was challenging the Prime Minister for the leadership, saying if, if he got it, he would immediately drop the starting price to be equivalent with, with Europe, etc. What that fails to recognise is the reason that we're going to a, an emissions trading scheme with a fixed price for three years going into flexible pricing is because Labor and the Greens were never going to agree on the adequacy of the target. And so it was determined to set up an infrastructure which was the Climate Change Authority which will determine the trajectory of emissions reductions consistent with that 2050 target and that the first trajectory lot would be handed down in 2014. Now you can't change that, you can't change the prices and the reason why it's $23 as opposed to uh, another price is because Treasury did its modelling based on a 550 parts per million scenario and a 450 parts per million scenario. They refused to model a 350 parts per million scenario, which is what we asked them to do. And a 550 parts per, uh, per million scenario is a $23 starting price going to 25. So that's why I'm telling you, if you were at a 450, price, 450 parts per million starting price would have been over $50. So that's when, you know, that's what you have to realise why that just didn't get picked out of the air. It's consistent with those kinds of figures. So that's why I'm saying upward ambition is so essential that we, uh, we recognise this is a beginning, it is a platform, it is not an end. Second point I'd make is coal. Uh, the idea that if we stopped exporting coal, India and China would just get their coal elsewhere. First of all, there's been a big campaign in the USA to stop new coal-fired power stations. And tragically, the response of that has been the coal companies now moving to go into a big export industry for coal. So the, the movement in the United States to stop new coal-fired power is now going to get rev up on coal exports. And it's an Australian company that's helping to build the port to get that, that export market going. Second point is India is or Tata, which is one of India's biggest co corporations, is saying you would be mad to build new coal-fired power stations because they're estimating that parity for solar 
will be mid this decade and they're saying that's it we won't be uh, building new coal-fired power stations and China <coughs> is already talking about a cap on coal by 2016. So in fact the people driving a massive expansion of coal mines and coal seam gas but coal mines in particular are actually exposing the Australian economy to massive risk not only in terms of carbon, uh, the climate accelerating issue, but because we are going into a massive economy dependent on digging holes for something that the rest of the world, as soon as solar in particular, gets onto parity, and we're not far away from that, they're not going to be able to uh, maintain the kind of uh, economy that they're thinking they're going to maintain. So just be aware, this is changing fairly quickly. Third thing, uh, when I mentioned one of our tasks is not only to reduce emissions, but to keep the, uh, the um, carbon stores intact. Forests is, of course, the clear example of that, and one of the campaigns we need to rev up around the country is the protection of native forests, which is great for the climate campaign, but great for species as well. Is government driving uh, coal, etc.? Yes, they are, and you only have to look at uh, the fuel tax credits in this year's budget. Two billion dollars goes to, as the, the ads are out there today, two billion dollars goes to the mining industry alone in the rebate of fuel tax credits. That is double what is spent on environmental programs in the Commonwealth and six times what is spent on national parks. So you've got an issue where we're talking about uh, two billion alone going straight to the mining industry. Add to that, they get uh, uh, tax breaks for exploration um, and uh, all that initial drilling. They get accelerated depreciation. They get uh, R&D uh, funding. You start looking at what they actually pay in tax and then what they get back in terms of all these tax breaks. You find that, that the scenario is there is no level playing field. People talk about the subsidies to the, the renewable energy industry, but in reality, the massive subsidies in Australia that are creating an uneven playing field are those subsidies which continue to go to fossil fuels. Um, the final thing in terms of how governments are facilitating this, you will have heard the discussion in the last week about getting rid of environmental regulation, the so-called green tape, as they're calling it. That is about facilitating the, the mining industry and the coal seam gas industry in destroying years of community campaigning in achieving reasonable environmental regulation to protect communities and the environment and what we are now seeing is a campaign by both the majors <coughs> to get rid of environmental regulation and there's this review of the EPBC Act and that is going to be where we will see this playing out. So, you know, you've got more than enough campaigns to worry about but they're just a couple of <laughs> others that I can mention. And Abbott, finally, um, Tony Abbott in terms of what he would repeal they, they voted against and, and argued against the Carbon Farming Initiative's Biodiversity Fund, but then when it went through, they said they wouldn't repeal it. We've now, as I said, moved the Clean Energy Finance Corporation into legislation so that it has to go through both houses, and I take the point about a double dissolution, but that can't be done quickly because the Senate has to reject something three times, so we're not talking about something that can happen three weeks after the election or anything like that. And in terms of emissions trading, when we get to it, I'll be very interested because in order to get the money to do direct action, the difference is what we're doing is raising the money from the polluters to put back. He's talking about what is effectively a competitive grants scheme, which will have to come out of the taxpayer's purse and there's already a $70 billion black hole with what Joe Hock is proposing. So the question that has to be put up to the coalition at all times is where is the money coming from? Where is the money coming from? Because their direct action has no money attached to it and it will become very attractive to uh, keep the carbon price because it shields them. And the campaign to run here is, does anyone in the community believe that a government will repeal a tax? <laughs> Does anyone in the community believe that? Because I can tell you they don't, and that's a winning campaign for us on Abbott on the carbon price. Yeah.